Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. This is our episode number 35. We are on the chapter, the four eights, twelfth paragraph. There is a link in the description to this paragraph. If you are not familiar with this text, please follow the link so that you get the text that we are exploring. In the last episode, Sri Aurobindo gave the overview of the scriptures that can help the limitations as well, because all the scriptures, however great they are, they are always partial expressions of the eternal truth, expressions that were suitable for a certain time period. And therefore, even though these scriptures are of immense value in our inner journey, we must keep our doors open to the new statements of the truth and new possibilities of yoga that is emerging as our collective evolution is unfolding. And the Supreme Shastra of Integral Yoga is the Veda secret in the heart of every thinking and living being. That's the eternal truth, eternal guide, eternal knowledge that we need to come in touch with, which will bring the flexibility, openness, and ability to adapt to the changing world context. And yoga itself can reformulate itself for the modern requirements. Now, with that, we move on to this episode where Sri will be now touching upon the effort that is required. Out of the four great instruments, first instrument is knowledge, second is the effort, third is the teacher, fourth is time. Now we are on to the second instrument, the effort, the abhyasa. The development of the experience in its rapidity, its amplitude, the intensity and power of its results depends primarily in the beginning of the path and long after on the aspiration and personal effort of the sadhaka. The development of the experience. So yoga is an experiential journey. It is not a theoretical exploration. It is not a theoretical understanding that would help us to progress. Yes, we need to understand the concept, but that's only a starting point to enter into direct experience. There is no replacement for experience. So the development of the experience in its rapidity and amplitude. For some people, arriving at experience takes a very long time. First is to know as a concept. Second is to really experientially know it. There is a time delay between the two. So the rapidity with which you can arrive at the experience, move from concept to actual experience, and the amplitude, the intensity and power of results, all this depends primarily on in the beginning of the path and long after. Two factors, the aspiration and personal effort of the sadhaka. This word aspiration is the master key to unlock integral yoga. Aspiration and personal effort. There is an effort required and there is an aspiration required. Aspiration is not desire. Aspiration is not mental will. Mental will is where that effort comes into the picture. Aspiration is the soul's longing. 
And aspiration is not limited to human beings. It is there across nature. It's an evolutionary force in nature that is propelling evolution. It is the same force that makes a tree to grow continuously or the seed to sprout, that force that moves towards light, towards our greater flowering. Everyone has it, more or less different degree of intensity. In some it is very weak, in some it is awake and very strong. So a strong aspiration and personal effort is required. Aspiration manifests in the form of our longing for truth, goodness, beauty, all that are the inner subjective movements and experiences of aspiration. The movement of aspiration it is something very universal. So in the beginning of the path and long after, the aspiration and personal effort of the sadhaka, these two things would define the rapidity, the amplitude, intensity and power of the results. So normally we are turned in external life and there is an inward turn and there is an intensity of aspiration with which we turn and the effort that we bring into it together brings the rapidity of the result, its amplitude, its power, all that. So let me read that line once again. The development of the experience in its rapidity, its amplitude, the intensity and power of its results depends primarily in the beginning of the path and long after. It's not just in the beginning, but also long after on the aspiration and personal effort of the sadhaka. The process of yoga is a turning of the human soul from the egoistic state of consciousness absorbed in the outward appearances and attractions of things to a higher state in which the transcendent and universal can pour itself into the individual mold and transform it. So the very process of yoga is of that turning, turning of the ego, ego absorbed in the outward life, its objects, its events, its attractions, attachments. Ego is tied to that. At one point, into, in, ego wakes up and turns to seek the divine. So, to seek that higher truth, to a higher state in which the transcendent and universal can pour itself into the individual mold and transform it. Sri Aurobindo mentioned in the previous chapters, the whole process of integral yoga is having these three stages where ego seeks to come in touch with the divine. That is the stage number one. Second is reception of that into the instrument and the elaborate purification. So th that is where when we come in touch with the divine consciousness, that would pour into the instrument prepare it, purify it, transform it. And then comes the larger transformation, upliftment of the entire instrumentation into its divine status as the third stage. So the first phase is where the effort is. And that effort is to come in touch with the divine consciousness, which having its transcendent and universal status would pour into the individual mold. Our individual instrumentation is a mold with its specific possibilities and limitations. So it is that pouring in of the transcendent and universal consciousness that would transform. So the process of yoga is a turning of the human soul. The human soul itself is bound by the ego turned in the outward appearances, lost and absorbed. It is when the human soul wakes up, it realizes it's serving the ego and turned towards the outer nature. 
and if there is a struggle between the soul within and the outer nature's ego and the turning the whole thing inward and soul's natural aspiration is to seek the divine. So there the ego itself has to learn to recognize the soul within and serve the soul. That's where the mental will begin to support the aspiration of the soul. Soul brings the aspiration. The mind and its intelligent will, buddhi, brings the support of the external instrumentation. So the turning of the human soul from egoistic state of consciousness, absorbed in the outward appearances and attractions of things, into a higher state in which the transcendent and universal can pour itself into the individual mold and transform it. The first determining element of the Siddhi is, therefore, the intensity of the turning, the force which directs the soul inward. The soul, when it is identified with its outer instrumentation and its ego, is absorbed and lost. So there is an intensity with which it can turn inward. That's the first determining element of the Siddhi. Siddhi is the perfection that we are seeking. The intensity of the turning, the force which directs the soul inward. And that intensity can come when often many people suddenly feel a complete loss of interest in all that they have been doing for years or decades. What we refer in Indian tradition as vairagya, a sense of dissatisfaction with the world as it is. And a rapid, a rapid dropping of all that one is doing. And it's turning towards something that is calling you. Even if you don't know, your mind still figuring things out. Why you are no more interested in life. Or it can also come as a, when the soul withdraws its sanction from the outer activities. Suddenly, not only the loss of interest in things, things can fail miserably in the outer life. All painful experiences can happen. And you may get pushed to turn inward, to question life and purpose of life. And that intensity of the turning and the vyakula, the, the, the intensity with which you seek, the desperation with which you seek, all that intensity would define that is the first determining element of the Siddhi. Is therefore the intensity of the turning, the force which directs the soul inward. The power of aspiration of the heart, the force of the will, the concentration of the mind, the perseverance and determination of the applied energy are the measure of that intensity. This intensity, Sri brings four different dimensions to it. First one is the power of aspiration of the heart. Deep within the heart region, this is where our aspiring soul is. Soul brings the aspiration. Aspiration is that which seeks the divine, seeks the perfection, seeks truth, seeks goodness, seeks beauty. It is there deep within us, deep within the heart. So the power of aspiration of the heart, that is the very first measure of that intensity. The second one is the force of the will. Will is intelligent will of the mind. We have our mental will that can look at all the impulsions of our lower nature all the attractions, repulsions, and mental will can also use clear mental understanding, a clear mental choice to support the aspiration of the heart, soul's aspiration. 
So the will of the mind has to support this aspiration of the soul. The heart's aspiration. Here the word heart and soul we can interchangeably use. By heart is not meant just the outer emotional being. Yes, emotions are to turn and support. So all that will happen when the mind's will also supports it. So the power of aspiration of the heart, the force of the will, second. Third is the concentration of the mind. Mind wanders from one thing to other all the time and dispersing in the phenomenal world. And we are unplugging from the phenomenal world and gathering all the scattered threads of the mind, concentrating and concentrating on the divine, on that aspiration to unite with the divine. So there is a concentration of the mind. And fourth one is the perseverance and determination of the applied energy. We have our vitality, the abundance of energy, especially abundance when I say the word. There are people with abundance of energy, there are people with low energy. We need abundance of energy to re even to seek the divine and proceed on the path. When you have low energy, very little energy, there is no possibility of a perseverance. You get tired very easily. So energizing yourself so that you can persevere in your effort and with that clear determination so that your energy, your concentration, mental will, heart's aspiration, all these four are intensely focused. And this would bring the rapidity of experience and progress on the path. So let me read this line once again. The power of aspiration of the heart, the force of the will, the concentration of the mind, the perseverance and determination of the applied energy are the measure of that intensity. The ideal sadhaka should be able to say in the biblical, biblical phrase, my zeal for the Lord has eaten me up. My zeal for the Lord. My seeking for the Lord. My thirst. My strong need for the Lord has eaten me up. You're consumed by that intensity of your seeking. Consumed by your passion for the Lord. Lord of yoga. The divine. So the ideal sadhaka should be able to say in the biblical phrase, my zeal for the Lord has eaten me up. It is this zeal for the Lord, utsaha, the zeal of the whole nature for its divine results. That the whole nature every layer of your being, every part of your being, everything seeking together, that's what brings the intensity of the utsaha. It is this seal for the Lord, utsaha, the seal of the whole nature for its divine results. Vyakulata, heart's eagerness for the attainment of the divine. Vyakulata is another Sanskrit word for that eagerness of the heart to attain the divine that devours the ego. It is these two, the utsaha and vyakulata, the zeal of the whole nature of the divine results and this vyakulata, the heart's eagerness, together they devours the ego and breaks up the limitations of its petty and narrow mold for the full and wide reception of that which it seeks. That which, being universal, exceeds and being transcendent, surpasses even the largest and highest individual self and nature. So what we are seeking is 
transcendent and universal it surpasses and exceeds all our tiny little narrow existence and this ego has to be devoured in this language it has to be consumed so that it surrenders opens up widens to receive that transcends this tiny little existence it is when that universal and transcendent divine existence pours into this little mold there is this experience and in a growth and the flowering of our soul so it is the seal for the lord with saha the seal of the whole nature for its for its divine results vyakulata the heart's eagerness for the attainment of the divine that devours the ego and breaks up the limitations of its petty and narrow mold for the full and wide reception of that which it seeks that which being universal exceeds and being transcendent surpasses even the largest and highest individual self and nature but this is only one side of the force that works for perfection there is the human side effort that is required that works for perfection and there is the other side so this is only one side of the force that works for perfection now let's see what is the other side the process of the integral yoga has three stages not indeed sharply distinguished or separate but in a certain measure successive three stages shirvinda has already touched upon these three stages in the earlier chapters we will retouch upon them so that it gets reinforced i remember having gone through this book multiple times every time when you reread and reiterate the same idea it really gets deeper and deeper and you begin to see its operation so let's see these three stages of integral yoga the process of integral yoga has three stages not indeed sharply distinguished or separate but in a certain measure successive they follow one stage after the other but not very sharply separate there must be first the effort towards at least an initial and enabling self transcendence and contact with the divine an initial and enabling self transcendence and contact with the divine enabling self transcendence there is coming in contact with the divine and there is a transcending of our limited ego bound personality soul involved and identified with the ego transcending that ego bound bondage enabling that so the effort towards at least an initial and enabling self transcendence and contact with the divine that is the very first condition next the reception of that which transcends that which we have gained communion into ourselves for the transformation of our whole conscious being this is the second stage so first is transcend the e- our individual soul identified with the ego remembering this and establishing the contact transcending the ego and there is that contact once established then there is a reception of that which is above the divine consciousness which is already perfect it pours in its perfection its force and light into the instrumentation and transforms the instrument that is the second stage so first is establishing the contact 
Second is the reception of the divine consciousness into the instrumentation. The reception of that which transcends, that which we have gained communion, we come in contact and communion, increasing identification into ourselves for the transformation of our whole being. Our transformation cannot be done by our own limited effort of the ego, its limited knowledge, limited will. Transformation can come only when the divine consciousness pours into it and we receive that into the mold. Transformation of our whole conscious being. Last, the utilization of our transformed humanity as a divine center in the world. That is the third stage of this uh, integral yoga. The last, the utilization of our transformed humanity as a divine center in the world. So the human vessel, human instrument, once having established the contact, having received and undergone transformation, become a center for the divine action in the world. You become the transmission point for the divine light and force to enter the world and act in the world. So the utilization of our transformed humanity as a divine center in the world, there is a utilization, there is a functional role, a utility for the instrument in the larger scheme of things. In the collective evolution that is unfolding on earth in which this human instrument will become useful in that context. So let me read these three stages once again. There must be, first, the effort towards at least an initial and enabling self-transcendence and contact with the divine. Next, the reception of that which transcends, that which we have gained communion into ourselves for the transformation of our whole conscious being. Last, the utilization of our transformed humanity as a divine center in the world. So long as the contact with the divine is not in some considerable degree established, so long as there is not some measure of sustained identity, sayujya, the element of personal effort must normally predominate. So, we had been covering the part of human effort. So, this effort from our side will be dominant, will be a primary character till we establish the contact with the divine and a sustained identity with the divine consciousness. Till that point, our effort will be a major dominant factor in the sadhana. It is only later, once the identification is well established, this effort is gradually replaced with a greater divine will and divine force. So in our first stage, this effort is necessary and will be a dominant part. So long as the contact with the divine is not in some considerable degree established, so long as there is not some measure of sustained identity, sayujya, the element of personal effort must normally predominate. And this is the period there is a great deal of confusion that happens because we do not yet know how to discern whether we have come in touch with the divine consciousness. What are the characteristics? What are the qualities by which we know it? And we are stumbling our way through and we are shifting from our mental will to our impulses, desires, ambitions, discerning all the lower nature's impulses and our possibility of coming in touch with the inner guide and again getting the signal right and following the signal faithfully, sincerely. These things take time. And that's where 
we wander, stumble our way through. And the intensity of turning inward to know and follow and commit, that would set in motion this stage of the journey faster. So there is this whole work of getting to know the divine guidance clearly, precisely, and to follow it consistently so that the contact is established and it becomes permanent contact. Till that point, this consistent effort is required. But in proportion as this contact establishes itself, the sadhaka must become conscious that a force other than his own, a force transcending his egoistic endeavor and capacity, is at work in him. And to this power, he learns progressively to submit himself and delivers up to it the charge of his yoga. So here is the next stage. The more we come in contact with the divine consciousness, the more we are able to recognize there is another wisdom at work, another force at work, and it is much wiser, vaster, more powerful, more comprehensive, more integral than our limited narrow understanding. And the more we are able to recognize, the more we are able to surrender to its influence and its action and let that force carry us forward in this journey. So in proportion as this contact establishes itself. So it is in proportion to the clarity with which we recognize the contact and ability with which we follow the guidance, this shift happens. So in proportion as this contact establishes itself, the sadhaka must become conscious that a force other than his own, a force transcending his egoistic endeavor and capacity, is work in him, because it is working through you. And not only through you, it is working through everyone, the whole life's context. It is an omniscient, omnipotent force that is working everywhere and through everyone. And in you, you, you it has picked you up for the journey. And it is beginning to shape you, arrange your life circumstances, and taking you forward on the path. And you begin to recognize it. There is something else at work through you. And to this power, he learns progressively to submit himself. So we learn to submit to that force and delivers up to it the charge of his yoga. So you would recognize that it is that which is in charge of your yoga, not you. You are only an instrumental condition. It is that which is shaping you progressively, shaping you, perfecting you, and putting you into a greater purpose, which is beyond your limited human comprehension. So in the end, his own will and force become one with the higher power. He merges them in the divine will and its transcendent and universal force. So we have our limited human individual will. That will merges with the vaster universal transcendent will of the divine. That's when the identification become well established and effort become effortless. So in the end, his own will and force become one with the higher power. And he merges them in the divine will and its transcendent and universal force. He finds it thenceforward presiding over the necessary transformation of his mental, vital, and physical being with an impartial wisdom and provident effectivity of which the eager and interested ego is not capable. So this is where uh, we begin to recognize that power which is presiding over your individual transformation. There is this great wisdom, great mother wisdom, divine wisdom presiding over your transformation and nudging you, pushing you, organizing that journey 
and Twitch user render. And you see that it is far more effective and efficient than anything our little individual ego can conceive and is capable. So he finds it thenceforward presiding over the necessary transformation of his mental, vital, and physical being. All the three layers of our being, instrumental layers, the mental layer, vital layer, physical layer, mental, vital, and physical being with an impartial wisdom. It is very impartial in its operations. It is not like our human limited egoistic intelligence and its will. So with an impartial wisdom and provident effectivity, it is effective of which the eager and interested ego is not capable. Our ego can be very, very eager, but it cannot have this effectivity of the divine wisdom that works comprehensively through the layers. It is when this identification and this self-merging are complete that the divine center in the world is ready. So as our identification become more and more complete and we are able to discern the divine will and surrender to it, com to it completely, there is a growing merging. And once that is well established, then the divine center is ready in the world for the divine light and force to act through. So purified, liberated, plastic, illumined, it can begin to serve as a means for the direct action of a supreme power in the larger yoga of humanity or superhumanity of the earth's spiritual progression or its transformation. Here is the bigger picture. It's not our individual liberation. It's not even individual transformation. It is collective transformation and even Earth's evolutionary progression and transformation. Sri always refers to the Earth consciousness. It is a shift happening on Earth for which we, the humans, are the instrumentation through which the divine is working out the process. And such an instrument has these qualities, what Sri Aurobindo is referring here, purified. First is purified. The divine light and force pouring in purifies the instrument first. Purification of the intelligent will, purification of our vitality, purification of our physical body and that instrumentation. All layers are to be purified. Once purified, then is liberated. They become free to act, to respond to the divine will. They are no more bound by the limitations of the lower nature. So liberated plastic. That means these instruments become flexible for it to receive the divine influx, divine inflow into the instrumentation. The mind must become open and receptive. The will must become, individual will must become open and receptive. The vitality must become, energy must become open and receptive, plastic, adapting. Body must become plastic, receptive, so that it won't crack up. These instruments won't break down when there is a higher intensity of the force and light pouring into the instrumentation. They don't burn out. So there is sufficient resilience, sufficient plasticity, so that greater force and will can act through the instruments. So purified, liberated, plastic, and illumined, illumination. This is where the higher consciousness pouring into the instruments as light. And as the light pours in, the mind gets illumined, your energy gets energized as the light pours into it and the body itself becomes lighter, more open to greater will and energy to act through it. So purified, liberated, plastic, illumined. It can begin to serve as a means for the direct action of a supreme power. The divine will, the divine force, the divine light can directly act in the instrument without distortion, without breaking the instrument, without any dispersion. It can work effectively through the instrument once the instrument is ready 
when it is purified, when it is liberated, when it is plastic, when it is illumined. And in the larger yoga of humanity or superhumanity of the earth spiritual progression, earth spiritual progression, it's not just our individual progression, it is earth's progression or its transformation. There is a transformation of earth happening of which we are a part. So there is the human effort on one side and on the other side there is the divine light and force pouring into the instrument, purifying it, liberating it, making it plastic and illumined so that the center is ready for the direct action of the divine light and force which is enabling the transformation and progression on earth and earth itself progressing of which we are the instruments. So that's the big picture that Sri Aurobindo is bringing in with all the three stages, first coming in contact, and the more the contact is established, we will experience there is less and less effort required because it is the divine will that will be working. So our individual will merges with the divine will. So in the second stage, there is a reception into the instrumentation where it is purified, liberated, made plastic, illumined. Then the center is ready. That's the third stage for the direct action of the divine consciousness in the world. So you become a willing servitor of the divine consciousness. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. Thank you. See you next week.